Folks, how are we? Uh, Saturday night, yeah, another strange Saturday night for everybody. Um, as obviously we're getting well used to this lockdown now, but the chats are continuing anyway. We're keeping them going. Uh, last night was absolutely brilliant with Shane Filan, but we have a big star as well tonight in Andy Lee and somebody who I'm really looking forward to speaking to. So we're going to get Andy tuned in, in a couple of minutes, and here he is now. And hopefully we'll have a bit of crack as well along the way as we normally do. Uh, it's Andy now. Oh, we we'll just get tuned in. Uh, in power, how are you, Paul? Hope you're doing well. Uh, how are you, Alan? Andy, how are you? Not too bad, how are you? How are you getting on? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Yeah, so you probably heard me there. Uh, we had Shane Filan on last night. We've had footballers on most weeks, Andy. This has turned into a bit of a thing now uh, at 9 o'clock each evening. So I'm seeing how long more we can keep it going for. Um, but they're turning out to be really good and interesting the chats. I think people are enjoying them. So it's... Um, it's my pleasure to have you on tonight as well. Someone who obviously I have a lot of admiration for, and I'm looking forward to chatting to you as well. Yeah, what what was your um, your motivation for for starting these chats? Basically, Andy, um, the lockdown kicked in, and obviously people were looking for things to do. This was this this is the third week now that I've done them, and as everybody was trying to get used to the situation that we were in, I actually seen. I think it was Jamie Redknapp was doing one with Harry Kane. So I just thought to myself, I might, might try this with a couple of, some of the footballers that I knew. So one week ran into two, two weeks ran into three. I have more lined up next week, but I think I'll take a break at the end of that. <laughs> to be honest. Um, yeah. but they've, been, they've gone really well. People have been great with their time. Everybody's coming on telling stories and obviously about their career and some funny things and um, some interesting, insightful things as well. So people are, are, are liking them, I think. So um, all the pressure's on you tonight. <laughs> I know, yeah, it's a bit... Uh... It's different, uh, I don't know, it's like a scenario, it's more, I don't know, it's more of, um, personal or something, because you're through the phone and through your yeah, social media kind of thing, it's, it feels a bit weird, doesn't it? I don't know, to me. Yeah, and that's the thing, like, it's, it, what a lot of people, the feedback I've been getting from a lot of people is the fact that it's a little bit more, people are more relaxed, it's more like two lads maybe having a drink, having a chat, um, and that's the format I'd much prefer as well, Andy, to be honest, so, um, it seems to be going well, anyway, as I say, the lads have been great, so... Uh, there's no pressure on you, but I've lots to get lots to get into. But before we do, how's lockdown treating you? Grand, yeah, just uh, ups and downs, don't you? I think everyone's the same. It's ups and downs, you know. It's uh, it's unprecedented. It's like a new new situation for everybody to deal with, mm. and a new reality. But it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's it, like I was. I've said it's not. I don't have a nine to five job, so it's not a huge departure for me. Um, I might find myself where I do have a week at home. You know, so yeah, it, it, you just like apart from socializing and mixing or traveling and going, going like out, I, it's not, it's not, it's not a big difference for me. You know, like you have like, I don't know. I think there's going to be a big effect from it. You know, even whenever the the restrictions are lifted and things go back to normal, I don't think they ever will because you're always going to be suspicious of people or getting close to people. It's like it'll be, it'll feel funny to be in a crowded room now after so long, out of out of it, you know. That's I suppose the worry I have. I'm the, the type I am, Andy. I know you. I've met you a few times, and obviously we played football and bits and bobs with the lads. But I'd be quite friendly and jovial and handshakes and hugging and kissing fellas and whatever. But as you said there, it probably will never go back to that now. And, and mm. the one thing I always find a bit strange now, when we go out for me walk in the morning or you're walking up to the village, as you're walking by people. Their reactions are, are just bizarre. Like some people are putting their hands up to their mouth, covering their mouth. Other people stepping aside, letting you walk around them. So, do you genuinely think it'll never go back to normal? It'll take a while, won't it? It'll take a while. Um, but who knows? Like things change. Like how, look how quickly we've adapted to this new new yeah. way of life. You know, so we could easily go back. But it's it's just just it's uh it's crazy crazy time isn't it it's crazy time that, that's that's another thing like the positives that i'm taking out of is obviously spending lots of time with the kids so you're out with them the whole time and mm -hmm. um, doing things with kids now that we maybe did as kids whereas nowadays the norm for the kids is to go to school come home there's technology computers phones all sorts ipads to have everything whereas we used i used to come in you throw the school bag straight out in the street game of ball playing with your friends and I find that they're doing a lot more of the things that maybe we used to do, uh, which I think is a good thing for them. 
Yeah, like uh, we'd regularly go to the Phoenix Park, it's not too far from us, and we might have only be like one of maybe two or three couples and there were kids, but since the lockdown, it's places packed with, uh, and it's probably not, it's not a good thing, but it's nice to see people mm. out with their kids in the outdoors, you know, and doing things like that, and uh, just exploring, and, and yeah, maybe like it is, that's it, like you can flip it in a, in a way, Obviously, we're we're restricted from what we can do, but look, what we can do is spend time with the ones we love. If you're lucky enough to, you know, it's a shame we can't see our parents or yeah. the older people or the grandparents, which my daughter finds you know difficult. But other than and her friends, that's that's a tough one. But other than that, we're just about you know. See, the fact as well, Andy, I suppose that as a boxer, you live such a disciplined lifestyle as well. Um, so maybe that's another reason. You too, you too. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're, 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 you're sitting in and out, out drinking. And, and I, that's what I'm finding with a lot of the football lads as well. Because they live disciplined lifestyles, it might be a little bit easier for them. Yeah, you're, kind of, you're used to cocooning anyway because uh, you're always watching yourself from getting sick anyway when you're boxing. You know, when you're training very hard, you're very conscious of anyone with a cold, and a lot of fighters don't even shake hands when they're trying to cut. You might just give a fist bump because of all of you know. You're afraid of getting a cold because if you get sick, you can't fight, you can't perform, and then that's it. You know what I mean? So yeah, a lot of the time, and you do spend a lot of time like resting in between training sessions. So you're in the house, you're in bed, or whatever it may be, watching yeah. TV or whatever. So yeah, it's I guess it's a little bit easier, easier to adapt. Okay, so where it all started for you, Andy? Obviously, you were born in London, and I think you were eight when you joined the boxing club, uh, Repton Boxing Club. But I suppose, as a young fella growing up and, and joining that club, was it always boxing for you, or was there other sports you played as well? No, I was just boxing. Um, being from like a gypsy traveling background, boxing is very, it's a big thing, you know, it's like just, it's just a way of life, you know, it's like, it's part of like a, um, part of your progression as you go old, I get older, grow up, you always every you know the every young traveler you see will try the hand at boxing some mm. will stick to it and some won't but um my older brothers both boxed and the next one up to me is six years older than me so you know i was growing up with it and so i always just wanted to get in there and do it and uh try to see what i could do yeah and because it's part of the culture then andy if it was a thing you didn't want to do with it um, is that frowned upon or is that okay? No, I think there were times when I was growing up when I didn't want to do it, you know, but um, not that my dad forced me off. Like, we never forced to do it, but it was definitely encouraged, you know, and if, if like, my older brothers would be going to the gym and my dad would be taking us, so I was always like, come on, you're, you're going, get in, you know, and, and I'm grateful that he did push me that little way and it's, it's something that me and my wife talk about now with our, with our daughter and we have another one on the way, so uh, it you think like how how much you push? You know, you, you know yourself with kids. You know, and especially this day and age, kids are doing everything. You know what I mean? There's so many things they're involved in, and yeah, uh, how much do you push them to do it? Do uh, and how much are they just being lazy or you know? And I think it's you have to judge it. But back then, yeah, you had a choice, but it was it would have been frowned, not frowned upon, but no. I think I think because we were all pretty good at it, you know, and I think my dad could see that, and uh, he wanted us to to do it, you know, and and then once I got to when I got to about fifteen, fourteen, well, well, once I got to about the ages of twelve and thirteen, I was going actively going myself, you know, I was like yeah. I would be looking to go myself, raring to go, and then when once I got to about fourteen, fifteen, I knew that boxing was probably the only other way I was going to make a life for myself other than following, which is all like within the traveling culture, which is already like a predetermined way of life, which is, you know, giving them school at a certain age and going to work. And, um, you know, that's, and the work would be like, you know, a lot of physical labor. Um, and I realized, look, I, I remember even having thoughts like, you know, I got boxing, doing pretty good. I'm winning the national title, winning the all Ireland every year, picking mm -hmm. up medals internationally. And this could be something that I could do and, and and it was a good social outlet for me, yeah. Because when I was four, we moved when I was fourteen, thirteen, fourteen. We moved from London to uh, Castlecon, County Limerick, and it's quite rural, you know. It's in the yeah side. And there was, was that always was that always the plan? I need to move home. Yeah, yeah. My mother's from Limerick, and my dad's from Dublin. Um, 
and they bought some land there um, years ago and then they moved back to build a house back when the boom was, you know, everyone was building houses. But, uh, <laughs> they, uh, yeah, now the, uh, that was always the plan. But it was like, it was very, it wasn't much to do. So it was in a train and um, like, had I stayed in London, I would definitely would have probably wouldn't have stuck with the boxing because I was already, really, yeah. Yeah, I was already getting into other things. You know, um, already like things, I don't know, things that take you away from boxing. Just being a teenager and running around the streets and, you know, there were other more exciting things to do. I had to carry down, but coming back to Ireland definitely sat me down and uh, focused on what I had to do, what I wanted to do, you know? Yeah, so it was so ingrained in you then. Obviously, you knew, as you said, once you came back to Ireland, um, it was the St. Francis Club you joined, Andy. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, went on to, I think it was the, the World Amateurs in Bangkok. I was only looking today, actually, when I was reading up about them yesterday. Like, in that, in that category, an age group, you had Golovkin, Lucia Bute, Matt Karaboff at the World Amateurs, which was, must be an incredible category. Mm. And to see the careers that and the progression that they had and what they went on to achieve, but little did people know back then of the talent, I suppose. Yeah, like from my Olympic um, eight, well, bracket, the first 75 kilograms, uh, 2004 Olympics, there must have, I think there's about six or seven of the lads went on to become world champions. You had Glavkin, who you said, Andre Durrell, um, John Pascal, several guys. The guy who, went, who beat me went on to become world champion. There was like... Several like world champions just came from that one, so it was not like it was always, and that's like that is the benefit of doing something from a young age as well as and having that amateur. No matter how good you are as a pro, I think you'll always fall back, and you're always at a disadvantage if you don't have that amateur background. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like my clubs, like I kind of like you talk the Repton Box Club. It's even to this day, it's to every year it's producing champions after champions, especially on the race junior boxers. So I was very fortunate, and it, was, it wasn't really planned. It was just where I lived and where I moved to, I had very good clubs, you know, going from Ref and then St. Francis, which was a perfect nurturing, kind of nurtured me and brought me along. And I was still able to to fall back on what I learned in Ref and then they, and develop that in St. Francis. And then I moved on to the national team, worked with Billy, like a ton of coaches would obviously when I got to see you know, Billy Walsh and around here and then obviously as a pro work with two or three of the best coaches I think probably really yeah I just try sorry and I'm trying to remove these a couple of these comments what is can it can you log out Andy and I log back in yeah no problem so I get out I get out and yeah, then come just back just then then I log back in yeah sorry one sec no about that yeah so we're back Andy's going to join back in Um some agents of comments, I don't know if, this world we live in, I don't know, nowadays it's crazy, people comments and she's talking absolute garbage uh, about God only knows what. Uh, but anyway, Andy's going to come back in, here he is now, and we'll get going again with the chat. Uh, <clears throat> one second there now. I know, I wasn't even looking at the comments. What was what was going on? I don't know. I don't know. The, the world we live in nowadays, Andy. The world we live in nowadays. You know yourself. It's yeah. like absolute headbangers. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Andy. Um, so yeah, so that was that was an incredible category, as you said. Is that would that be the norm, or was that an exceptional category of seven or eight for them to go on to have the careers they've had? I don't. I don't know. Someone have to look into it, but it was. Ex I think it was exceptional. Yeah, the, like the amount of champions that came out of it. Um... I, I can forget the guy even I beat went on to become, win a world title uh, Alfredo Angulo from Mexico um, the guy from Germany Lucas Willicek went on to win a world title the, the guy from Hungary Karol Bolzai he won a world title so there were guys who didn't even medal there who went on to be like serious pros okay uh, yeah so it was yeah it was an, an exceptional year tough year <laughs> tough year and did you Andy before you went to the Olympics did you have obviously had aspirations to become a professional was there ever talk before of that, or was it just after the Olympics? And I know, obviously, um, the option was there to stay on as an amateur, but uh, had you made your mind up, was it only afterwards, or was it kind of in your head beforehand? Um, it was in my head because I won a silver medal at the World Juniors in 2002, and uh, got, Emmanuel Stewart was in touch in between then and the Olympics, and that kind of turned my head a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, was yeah, that the well, first deal as you ever had with him? 
Yeah, he just got in touch. He actually rang. I was just I've told this before, but he actually rang on Christmas Day, which would have been Christmas two thousand and two. And I couldn't believe I thought it was a wind-up, you know, someone ringing me pretending to be Emmanuel Stu because it just came out of the blue, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was it was kind of changed my life that moment that, you know, I realised... Because I thought, uh, even then, but that was... I, I told him on that, on that call, look, I'm, I got a good chance going to Olympics, so I want to focus on that and let's talk again. I keep in touch and I will talk again after it. At the mm. Olympics, and that's what that's the way it went, you know. That's the way it kind of went. But there was a lot of, like I said, it wasn't that straight a straight a road. It was a lot of ups and downs, and the option to stay amateur was there. And the sports council put together a package for me to stay amateur, and but it eventually never came. All like the promises that they'd made then, mm. when they were trying to get me to commit to staying amateur, I told them, okay, I'll stay amateur. The next day, there was a press conference in this national stadium with the Sports Council and the, the the Irish Amateur Boxing Association. And it was still three or four months after the announcement that I was staying amateur and they hadn't come through or put together this package that was supposedly being put together for me. And look, and, um, and I'd already turned down this huge offer to go to America. So it was a bit of a kick in the teeth. So that I had to go back with my tail between my legs almost and okay. speak to Emmanuel and see if it was to resurrect the deal. and. Which eventually came about, but it was, you know, it was, uh, wasn't all that plain, plain sailing. Yeah, that was obviously a tough time for you then, but then you did make the move. So I suppose it just goes to show you because he became such an influential figure in your life, Andy. Uh, manager, trainer, almost like a father figure type, I suppose. Um, and you've spoken many times about the, the relationship that he had. But I suppose that proves the talent that he always believed you had and as well the fact that he was still willing to take you after, I suppose, you turned it down before that. Yeah, and it became more than just a box, like you said, it more than just box or coach. It was, uh, and I think that's, that's why he put his faith in me as well, you know, because he knew the personal relationship we had. Um, but yeah, he'd always, he, like, the first time we spoke, he said, you'll be world champion, you know. And, okay. uh, like that's, and, it, and it's okay him saying that, well, for a young lad yourself at 21, how much belief did you have in yourself um, of actually going on and achieving a hell of a lot in, in the game? Yeah, I was, uh, I, was, I was always confident, you know, in, in what I could do, a little bit cocky even, you know, and I think you, you need, when, yeah. you're, when, when you're young, you like that, aren't you? You know what I mean? You yeah. need, probably need that when you're boxing, you know? And, uh, well, you see, it's, it's obviously more prominent in boxing, but when I hear you speaking and, and you never really get into that kind of, arrogant cockiness trash talk stuff that sometimes you see nowadays with someone but I suppose as a young lad just in terms of the belief and the confidence you had in yourself that was always there was it? Yeah and you can always have you don't have to shout it from the rooftops you know, the, the ones who shout it are probably the ones who don't have it you know it's the ones who are quiet yeah the ones who are like who are, sh are strong in their belief they don't earn themselves you don't have to tell it to everybody you know but everyone's different as well so yeah. So then I suppose the progression you were taking, you were winning fights, Andy, and obviously you were setting you up for um, that first world title shot, which I think came in 2012 against um, Cesar Chavez. Did you feel at that stage you were ready for that? I was ready for it. I was probably, yeah, it was, it was a long time coming. Um, I was probably ready for the year before then, you know, but I just couldn't get the fight and I had problems getting a title fight, you know, you it's, once you get to that level, it's very political and it's all yeah. about wrangling and maneuvering rankings and things like that. And um, yeah, like uh, emotionally and mentally, I was ready, but um, I'm not sure if I was ready technically, even or I'm not sure even physically. Like physically, the the fight it's well documented now. It was wasn't fought on e on equal terms, and I'm not sure if I was prepared for that even. And uh, the training, like the training and the preparation for it, wasn't ideal. Emmanuel was there a lot. Of, Emmanuel was also training with Vladimir Klitschko, and who had a fight a week after me. And so, for the last, for a lot of the last, last, like the main weeks of the camp, Emmanuel was actually away. Okay. Um, and I was training with his nephew, who's a very good trainer, and recently trained Tyson Fury to become world champion. So there's no, that's not, you know, but <coughs> would. Definitely, with Emmanuel not being there, it definitely it definitely affected me. I think you know it's, it's no no point in mincing my words because it did affect me and uh, it affects your confidence. But 
it, it was it was it wasn't anyway the, i don't really like talking about it too much because there's no point in going over all that stuff you know it's done dusted now yeah. but um but in terms of that stuff as well andy that where obviously he wasn't around did mm. you ever say that to him or did you feel you were in a position to say like what's going on here i have a title fight next week and you're off was it because of maybe that higher rank fighter that he felt it? That yeah, well, I, the Vladimir's fight was set in stone before. I, I only got the fight with Chavez because <coughs> I told you about the Like, Martin Murray was due to fight him and not okay. me. Martin Murray was supposed to go to America and fight him. But then Martin Murray has a criminal record, so I couldn't travel to America and fight. So they turned around to the next best challenger, and that was me, or the next highest ranked challenger, and that was me. So I ended up getting the fight. Before that, Emmanuel was already set to go train Vladimir, so I knew that was going to happen. So I couldn't re like I couldn't really um, have anything to say. You know, it was worth yeah. take the fight or don't take the fight. You yeah, know, you're not going to have Emmanuel, but so you're going to take the fight. And that was that's the way it is. In terms of that stuff, I suppose you said there the, the political side of it and the wrangling to get the fights. Um, just how I suppose frustrating can it be? In one in one sense, and as you say, there you probably weren't the first um, option for them. But you feel as though you're ready for a fight, then it might be taken away from you. So just how difficult is that stuff? Just to get fights together. And if you if you're not with like one of the top promoters or in boxing, it's very very hard. You know, a lot of fighters like that. All of that stuff, trying to get fights, not getting opportunities, people making your promises and not fulfilling them. A lot of boxers get demoralized and you yeah know, it, just, it becomes tainted for them then and uh the head is so caught up in all of this you're not sure who you can believe there are like there are different people telling you different things you have a manager you have a promoter <coughs> and my situation was was even was difficult because i had a, there was like consortium consortium of businessmen who put up the money for a manual to sign me so they were having their say, and then Emmanuel was Emmanuel, and then also had a promoter, Ludabella, and there was all, you know, all these different people pulling in different directions at, at a time when, which was vital in my career. And so you're not sure which way to go. And then you also, you, 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 you know what I mean? Boxing is very difficult because it's a business relationship, but it's, it's not, it's a coach and a boxer's relationship. And we mean Emmanuel was even more than that because I was living with him in his house for all those years and we were beyond that. So it was very hard to separate all those things. Yeah. And yeah, like I said, it, a lot of the time, like a lot of times I would have completely justified him walking away from boxing. And, and uh, was there moments when he wanted to? Oh yeah, lo plenty of times, yeah. Like, and I, no, I don't think I ever fairly fought I wanted to, but never thought, like, I never accepted that I could or that, you know, um, or, or, or would, but, uh, no, there were, there were a lot of times, like, a lot of contractual, like, these, and you're dealing with lawyers and people are doing this all, like, in all their lives, you know I mean? This is their job, is just to contract and negotiate, you know, and whether it be promotional contracts or but managerial contracts or, or fight, back, even fight agreements can be mm. quite, like, you know, you think it's simple, but it can be quite dense, you know, and, and the language, you think you got something on one page. On page two, you got you you kind of got something in the deal, and then on page seven, it's taken back. You know, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's it's. it's I uh, could imagine how frustrating it is for lads. Yeah, it must be. Um... All you want to do is fight, and you're like, and for me, I was living, I was at, I was disadvantaged. I was living in Detroit. I was with Emmanuel, you know, and then, and sometimes in some ways, we negotiate. I'm negotiating against him. Because he's undecided the managers or whatever it is, and I'm yeah. still living with him. And like I'm in Detroit, and like I'm all of them tra I'm training. I'm all, I'm in many miles away from home, and uh, like I just you just want to fight, and you, and you wonder like what you what do you do? Like it's, like I said, you want disillusioned, um, and uh... so then obviously um, <coughs> we moved to Adam Booth then, mm. um, in I think that was 2012, was it? And mm. um, how did that come about? Was there a relationship there before with him? Obviously, he was doing very well at the time as well. Or was that something that you pushed to, to pursue? Or how did it come about? Yeah, um, I lost to Chavez. And Emmanuel, Emmanuel got sick. And there was a bit of a crossover there. Like, and Emmanuel passed away in this 2012. Mm -hmm. um, but I had always watched Adam from afar. And I, I didn't know him. Never spoke to him in my life. Um, and the only experience I had with him was when he was in the corner against Vladimir Klitschko 
for David Hay. Yeah. Playing David Hay. And I was obviously with Emmanuel and Vladimir in the opposite corner. Um, and so we weren't even on the right, even on the same team. The only, and um, so that was the only experience I have. But from watching him and they do his work and watching him, like uh, when I was to box, I still do to say watch all the corners and watch which way how the coaches communicate and ha and even some small training videos you can get to see. And um, yeah, so I, yeah, I approached him um, through a few mutual friend could I go down to the gym and we we, we talked we did a few training sessions and uh, it was very difficult very difficult adjustment and uh, transition because of being trained in one style for so many years yeah it was hard to, to totally break that up and it took a long time but yeah and again like with Adam uh, the relationship went beyond boxing and coach eventually you know that even to this day, we're still very good friends and we talk yeah. once a week. Like That's something as well, Andy, that obviously we're going to get to in terms of you're getting rave reviews now about the punditry stuff and you obviously enjoy that. But as you were a boxer, was that something as well? Because it's funny, I do a bit of punditry now, but I was always, even as a player, more interested nearly in that side of things. And, and as you said there, you're watching corners, watching coaches. Um, was that something that you were always interested in as you were kind of growing up? It wasn't just the fighting side of things. No, I like you always want to see how he, other people do things, you know. And uh, I think you can learn from any, like you can learn from anyone that can teach you a lesson, you know. Even even if someone is not like a boxing a boxer or a coach, they can have something that you can take away from and you can use yourself. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I always keep in mind that. And uh, the punditry is something that's just kind of happened organically and it's, I'm very fortunate to do it because I don't you know I don't have an agent or a contract with any TV company or anything yeah. like that to just yeah. give me a call on a, on a Wednesday and say will you come to Manchester on a Saturday and do the fights and I say yeah of course I will and uh, yeah but the reason uh, the call is you're very good at it and we're going to get to it now in a minute but just before that I want I suppose the biggest night of your life and career when you did become world champion was that something as well Andy that after the experiences of Chavez did you feel a lot more confident going into the fight with Karbov or um, I suppose the fact that you'd been with Andy uh, with um, Adam for probably three, four years at that stage. How important was that? I suppose going into that fight. It was, um, yeah, that experience ne never left me anyway. You know, and I was definitely all of the things that um, I was exposed to in the Chavez fight, or the, even the build up and the, the lead up to it. I was definitely insulated from all those things. I had a very team I had like I had a camp coordinator I had Adam who was technical coach I had somebody looking after everything my wife was doing the coach I just had everything boxed off and I knew where I was going and what I was doing every minute of every day and I had the power to say no to things because even with it like with the Chavez fights you know they call you up out of the blue at 11 o'clock day for the way in 11 p.m. at night you have to go do an interview in a, a TV studio downtown in El Paso Texas um, we're staying out, out in the outskirts because we didn't want to be around, you know. Yeah. And so you're like, you're, you're so obviously it's last minute night for the way, and you're being drove in the car. And if you don't do it, you're you're in breach of contract. So you have to do it. And there's there was a million of those type of things going on, you know. Whereas with with this fight, um, Adam was just you know Adam was just very. Uh, What's the best word? How do I describe him in the most friendly? Like he, do, uh, he doesn't take, he, he does things his way, and that's it. You know what I mean? He's not going to conform with anybody, you know. And he has to, he just, he's very strong, strong-willed. And uh, yeah, no, with like, I knew that was my last chance. You know, had I not, like, I knew at that stage. I think I was what twenty. I was thirty, probably at that stage. And I knew that had I not won it then and there, I would have. That would have been the end of it, you know. At that time in my life, and it was one chance to, to really make, 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 make it. You know what I mean? Because I'd had a great career. I fought yeah. for a title, and people think like when you're at that stage, you're making millions. You're not. You know, you're not. You just. And at the time, I was married in 2013, and you know, me and my wife, and like my, my not my my future wasn't like uh, I would say I wasn't. I wouldn't have. I would had I had to retire. At any stage before I won the world title, I still would have had to go and get a job and go back to work. And you know, 
you don't know what your options are when you when you're when you're involved in things like that, you know. On that but, one, Andy, yeah, you mentioned it. You feel it's your last chance. Does uh, does that add even more pressure to the fight, or are you good at coping with that type of stuff to kind of block that out and just concentrate on going into the fight? Yeah, you you, you are concentrating, but it's at the like when you're training. It's at the, it's always it's a motivation, but you got to be careful not to let that emotion, you know, overpower everything because then you make the fight bigger than it is or the event bigger than it is. You know, you think it's like this life-changing opportunity, which it is. Mm-hmm. You're not, you're not, you have to accept that and let, let that come in and then let it sit with it. And then you have to just think of it as just a fight, you know. It's something like... And, and that's, that's something that you can forget when you're, when you're involved in a big event, that it's just it's what you do every day in the gym. And it's no, it's no different. And yeah, but it does inform everything you do because you know it's always in the back of your mind to win this one. And like, you know, you win a million fights all, all through your life, but one fight you'll always, re- like that, those fights are the ones that always get remembered. So yeah. just, just like, just let me win this one. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's just like, <laughs> just let me win. Because like, once you won that, once you become a world champion, that's it. Like, you know, it's never getting taken away. Like, it's there forever. You have the belt, it's in the house. It's there. You know, it's there. So, uh, do you yeah. get to keep the belt forever? Yeah, you get to keep the belt, uh, um, and they get the, the, the whoever the organization is, they send send the new champion a belt whenever he wins it. Yeah, okay, brilliant. So it takes pride of place now, I'd say. Yeah, uh, so it's not, it's not, <laughs> uh, if you walked <laughs> to my house, you wouldn't think I was ever a boxer. There's nothing around the house, you're not, you're not marching around the house with it and all no, that, no, no. And stuff. driving around with it on the dash of the car. <laughs> <laughs> You're not walking into the second Kansas lads and waving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I suppose that it was the most amazing moment for you, Andy. And I suppose then the homecoming and, and the welcome you got back home, and then going down to Limerick, that must have been amazing. Yeah, it was like it was like a movie, wasn't it? It was like a dream, like you know. And uh, it was just all those years of hard work. It made them all worthwhile. Like and uh, yeah, the fight was very satisfying and. It, it uh, yeah, it was like, I don't know, what can I have to say? It just um, validated all the work I, and years and sacrifice I did because it would have been all for nothing, like, you know, leaving home and doing all that stuff that I did. Uh, well, it would have been for nothing. So it just made it all worthwhile. And then the Hong Kong was, was unbelievable. Like, the Limerick was, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was fun. <laughs> like, yeah, I remember. Great. That. I know that, that was a great, great, whatever I was, cha- I was champion for just over a year. And it was, mm-hmm. it was a great time, you know, it was, it was really it was a great time. And on, on, on that then, Andy, as you said, you had spent so long getting there, then you had the disappointment with Chavez, then you go on and win it. You mentioned there about, obviously, you felt it might have been your last chance. Uh, you were hitting 30, 31, you were getting married, and you're very much a family man. At what stage then does it turn to the afterlife, I suppose, or even though you were the champ and there was a couple of fights after, but was, was that in the back of your mind then, a target, or not a target, but a, a point where you... T- where you felt as though, okay, this is where I bow out. No, I would have. Um, no, only after I lost the lost lost the world title, I still pushed hard to get a rematch, and um, I had an injury. I, I suffered an injury before the fight, actually. That that may, it didn't affect me in the fight, but it um, made me made me take time out. So I kind of had to couldn't get back right back into it, you know, and um, and then. After like after being so dedicated for so many years, I uh, I chose to take time out as well, you know, and um, see where see which way it lies. Because you know, you know yourself when you're training and fighting or playing sport or football, or whatever, you don't get to do many things like you know that normal people can do, like go to the yeah, court. Of course, yeah. just just go on holiday, book a holiday, and go on it. Because you can book a holiday, then a fight comes up, and then you the holiday's cancelled, which happened many times. You know what I mean? So. Uh, and then, look, yeah, once, once, once you had that time off and then um, my first child was on the way, I had one last fight in March 17 and um, it was in the Mad Square Garden. And that was like, in the back of my mind, I said, this could probably be, this would probably be my last fight. Um, because, like when you, when you reach a certain, like you're fighting all your life to get up and then you reach a certain level and then, then you're making money that, really impacts your life you know boxing is a financial thing as well and um so i kind of stayed available and there were some fights that could have happened but the money was never enough to tempt me to get back in the ring in terms of 
you know, baby on the way, your wife, and putting them through me going away for whatever amount of time and training. So, you no, know, um, it was just time to retire. It was the right time, you know. And you know, yeah. yourself, you know, the hunger isn't there, and there are hungrier, younger people coming up, and um, you don't want to lose. You don't want to lose to somebody just because you didn't put it all in, you know. Like and I suppose the other side of that as well, it's a dangerous sport, as we know. So you're thinking the family, the kids, you want to do things going forward. Um, so that's obviously in the back of your mind as well. Yeah, I want to be like in boxing. Like I don't, I want to be looking after them and them not looking like. No, I mean looking after me. Yeah. When you're, you know, you're walking around. You or still whatever. want to be talking out for the five side with me and the second captains. <laughs> that's, that's, that's look. I knew there was a future there for me somewhere. <laughs> Well, listen, you, you see me on the pitch, you know this, but yeah. uh, that's not going to happen. We haven't performed well at all. We need to raise our game for next right. year. I didn't miss last year, and I missed last year, but I'll be there this year now. This yeah, year. definitely, yeah. Okay. Uh, the boys are great, uh, the lads are brilliant, as you know. Yeah. Um, so then, Andy, yeah, you get round to do, and I suppose you're, you're obviously, you're, you're very much uh, a box in mind, so the coaching team is probably a natural uh, progression for you. But the punditry before that, Obviously, as I said, you were getting rave reviews and still are. Is that something that you mentioned there? It just kind of happened, it came about, but you obviously love it. Yeah, it's just, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a gift, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's not a job. It's like, you get, to be, yeah, you get to be ringside. Like, you get to be ringside at the fights. You're in a position of kind of privilege. Uh, you're on TV. You're staying relevant. And you're talking about something that comes natural to you, you know? And it's just... Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an absolute gift, isn't it? Like, so as much as I can do, I will do it. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's 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 grand. Like, and I, it's like I think like when you're doing it, you take I take it serious as well because you're there to inform people and try and give some sort of insight because they want to hear something that they can't see. You know, they want to they want to want want to, like I think so. You you have to offer an insight and show them something that they're seeing but they can't really verbalize it. You know. Or, or, or notice what, what's going on and that's 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 what I like your job as well you know like breaking that's the secret that's yeah. the secret to it the two things I you try to be honest is the first thing <coughs> um, because the fans are not silly like if you're calling mm. something that the fans are watching it as well and if you're trying to cover up yeah. something to see straight through that you lose all credibility and respect I find and the other thing as you said you treat it like a job and take it serious because you do your research your homework all that kind of stuff mm. the amount of people I find that don't do that um, and, and it almost frustrates and annoys me like I watch the football lads and some of them because of maybe they have a big name they just think I just rock up and do it which but I think people can see through that as well though yeah they do but it doesn't stop them from getting jobs does it yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean the yeah. name sometimes the name recognition is, is better than the actual thing you know but uh, like I, I, yeah, I know you, it, people are a lot more informed the these days no, big people are a lot more informed these days you know, and especially with social media now, they can they have a platform where they can let their thoughts be known. Yeah. So um, if you if you if you're not put, if you're not like putting in the work or doing your research, then it's it's obvious, isn't it? You know. Of course it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, Andy, you're really good at. I love listening to you. I'm a boxing fan anyway, but I love listening to you on it. But the coaching side of things, then. Um, how much, I suppose, as I said, was that, that was always in the back of your mind, I, I presume, as you were kind of coming near the end. How much are you enjoying that as well? Obviously, I think you're looking after Jason, Jason Quigley, um, and he's obviously, he's, he's looking to maybe progress in his career going well. But the big man is Tyson Fury, who everybody saw, you were involved in that fight a few weeks ago, which was an amazing occasion and, and triumph for him as well. Mm. Yeah, I never really thought I would coach Alan. To really, yeah? Yeah, no, I... Um, I just never. Ha I don't. I don't. I didn't have a great desire to do it, especially when I retired. You know, people were asking. Um, but it just kind of happened. It kind of just happened. And there was this, this kid called Paddy Donovan um, yeah. from Limerick, and uh, I was watching. I'm watching him for years, and no knew, knew how good he was. Or heard, always heard how good he was, and then saw him a few of his fights, and yeah, like you can see, he's just so talented, and then. Um, his dad, I know his dad, his dad was talking to me, Martin, and uh, they said they wanted to turn pro and could I help him, blah, blah, and one thing led to another, the next thing I'm training and managing him, you know, but he is an unbelievably, like, since, like, he's, he has a, all the ability to be a world champion, no, no doubt in my mind, from what I can see. Okay. Yeah, and then, uh, 
so he's he's he was the my first step in there and I started training him, managing him, got he signed with Top Rank, now got him signed a deal with Top Rank who are what the biggest one of the biggest, if not the biggest in boxing. And then um Jason quickly came along and I'd always been in touch with Jason and uh because we had kind of similar paths in terms of him being an American. I know the landscape over there. And then when he lost the fight to Torino Johnson, I, I had a very similar setback myself in my career, a similar stage. So I just, we're well, not looking to train, just sent him a message and, you know, told him, don't be worrying, I know how it is and what, 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 what way it'll go out. And we met and then he asked me to train him. And then, uh, again, that was just something I said, I'll help you out, I'm not going to train you. And next thing I'm training him now as well. So, so just, uh, just kind of have him, but look, it's a handful. It's, it's, it's not something that's, it's a full like it's full time job, like, yeah. even though you're only in the gym, whatever, like three hours a day. But you're constantly organizing training for them, organizing sparring for them, thinking about the next session, planning the training, and uh, it does take like when they, they only have to turn up in the gym and then switch off, you know, once they go home. But so it, yeah. there's a lot of work in, in coaching. But I enjoy it, and um, I'm doing nothing else with it. <laughs> so in I, terms of, I suppose, in terms of Paddy, a young fighter, Andy, and for. For you to say those things about him and him to hear them from you and someone of your stature must fit him with unbelievable amounts of confidence. Yeah, he's calm. He's confident, lad. Anyway, you'll see him yourself one day. But like, uh, I, I, look, I, I, I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. You know, I was just about yeah, to say, like, yeah. from you, you're not yeah. going to fill him with kind of. Um, but it's down to him and like talent alone, and um, he is a hard worker, but. It's a long career. He's only had three fights now, and it's a long, long way to go. He's only twenty-one. Yeah, but there are so many other things that can happen in life, and you know, attitudes change, relationships change. But if he can keep going the way he's going, keep his feet in the ground, yeah, he has all the ability in the world, and he's he's kind of got the perfect uh, perfect setup with in terms of the, the manager. Like he hasn't got a he's got hasn't got a minion. He's got me to train him and manage him, so I can. Def- guide him in terms of there's not many people pulling him in different directions that's what I'm yeah. not that I'm a great man like, not I have proved myself in any way as a manager or trainer no but I think we, we had Andy Reid on the other night and again Andy spoke about his experiences going through as a young kid and a much he's looking after the Irish under 18s now and he spoke about obviously the way he treats them is a lot to do with the experiences that he has and he can guide them in a much better way so, like you spoke here a few minutes ago about obviously people pulling in all sorts of directions, you don't know who to trust, the political side of things. For Paddy to have someone like you in the corner who'd be honest and straight up with them and have their best interest at heart hmm. must be a great thing for him. Yeah, but you know, when like it's well, yeah, it is great as well, but I'm not, not, not saying Paddy will have this, but like when you don't, when, you, when you've never had it bad, you don't know how good you have it, do you? That was okay. like, you know, the difference between night and day between the Chava situation and going to the Carabao situation. Like, the, the difference was night and day, and I knew how good it was going to the Carabao because I'd had that bad experience where, like, um, boxers are so fickle and their heads can be easily turned, you know what I mean? So okay. it's always like, you know, what have you done for me lately kind of thing. So I don't know. Like, you just, look, we just navigated together. It's a long, long road, but mm. as I said, it's, he has all the ability. He works hard. And it's just about dedicating himself outside of the gym and keeping his feet in the ground, not letting it go to his head. Mm. And me telling him he's we're going to be world champion all the time. That won't help, but you know what I mean? But, uh, I hope he's not watching yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of then, I suppose, what all the experiences, again, Andy, you got from Manny and then Adam Boone, what kind of a coach were you? Have you taken a lot from them or just snippets and you do what you want to do, with, I suppose, in your own style? Mm. Yeah, I definitely draw from both of them. Uh, definitely, definitely. Like, um, they're completely different styles, but similar, similar philosophies and similar, like similar in a lot of ways and completely opposites in a lot of ways. And trying to trying to find a balance between those two things, two styles, and then trying to find my own style. And I think with Paddy, I'd never coached before, and then me and Paddy are working together. And he's a guy who's been on the Irish team and fought in the Junior Olympics and all things like this. So he's worked with high-level coaches. So I'm learning as, as he's learning. And, um, yeah, so I'm like I'm still finding my, my identity, I think, as a coach as well. That's something that's still being... And I think you'll always be like that. I think, you know, I don't... I think, yeah, you're always learning. Yeah, you're, you're always going to try and find something new. 
but um, definitely, yeah, being able to, like, even when now I'll, I'll, I'll remember something that I did. Like, say with Tyson, he won, He came back and he wanted the Kronk style, and that's why he asked me, and I recommended Sugar Hill Emmanuel's nephew to, for as a coach. And so during all that training camp, we were just think, I was always just thinking, like, what would Emmanuel do here? What would Emmanuel do in this situation? What would he say? And... And uh, yeah, he was definitely like a big influence. And even now in that in that training camp, um, that's there was a lot of Emmanuel stuff that we were teaching. I'm glad you brought him up because I can't let you go without speaking about him, Andy. Um, and I suppose I we all know he's a charismatic character. He's obviously very talented. Um, he's turned his whole life around. And I suppose that's the side of the story that I'm kind of more interested in him, the person, and and I suppose what he's gone through and where he's come from and and what he's achieved. It's just. He seems to be an unbelievable character. Mm. You see all that um, flamboyance and like large and life stuff, but when you when you're actually with him, uh, he's an absolute gentleman and really, he, I have to say, he's a sweet, sweet, per, like sweet person. Like he's like he seems well. He's thinking, yeah. he seems thinking to the wife. He's obviously a big romantic and yeah, yeah, yeah. Soft cycle, yeah, there is like I uh, like. I went up there. I I, I was going to be in LA anyway. Um, me and my wife had a holiday booked to go to LA for five weeks from the end of December into January. And um, then he asked me what I had to train him. So I said, Look, I'm going to be there in LA and I'll come up and down. When, when my wife goes home, I'll come to the camp full time. <coughs> but so I was traveling up there and um, you're not really sure. Like I, we've been around each other for a lot, but not, not ever in that dynamic. You know, you're never really quite sure, but how it's going to play out when you're going up into, into, into a new situation. Like, you know, when there's a dynamic in a relationship, formed in a relationship, it's very hard to break that. You know, it's yeah. very hard to break it. Like once, once, uh, yeah, like so before, before, before your training and over the years, is it just a kind of a, a more like a friend relationship? Obviously? Yeah. So that was always there. I think he looks up to me, but I also, I'm looking up to him, you know, in that kind of way. So it's, yeah. there's a mutual admiration there. And, um, but yeah, just, just as I said, when you see just what just to witness him work and how hard and dedicated he is and how serious he is, that really took me back because you see all these videos, previous videos when he trained, and it was all like flashy stuff and woo woo and singing and dancing and all that, playing around. But when we were in that training camp, he was unbelievably focused and like he didn't cut one corner or, or like allow himself any. Like he didn't allow himself any, not even like something like a soft drink or, or, or he just he just ate and drank and slept perfectly for 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 a fight, you know, and didn't do any extra extra like activities. It was gym and home, gym and home, gym and home. We were in Las Vegas, but we could have been anywhere. We could have been in Roscommon because we didn't see no nowhere. We went to the gym and went home, and um, yeah, he was extremely focused, and that's where you see the results, and that like. It's it's always the same, like you know, it's uh, the people at the top of the games, whatever sport it is, whatever it is, business sport, whatever, they work extremely hard. Yeah, he does, like yeah. And then I suppose Andy, you're saying there, you're cut off, I suppose, from the outside world. He is that big charismatic character. Just for for example, say when you do come home from the gym and it's just you and him in the house that evening, how do you switch off? Like, does he talk about mm. football? Does he talk about like all the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he uh, he doesn't nap during the day. He's a, he's got such an active mind, and most fighters would nap. So like, um, we'd spend a lot of time just sitting up talking. Stand, like he'd have his breakfast, do his training, have lunch. He was eating five or six times a day over there. He had a chef, um, George Lockhart, who's I didn't know, but he's famous in the MMA world. And this guy's unbelievable. He's like a real, yeah, he's an unbelievable guru. Like he, he would like feed Tyson during the day and tell Tyson to within like an ounce of what weight he'd be to the next day. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And and the same with Isaac Lowe, who was a one thirty five pounder, like he's a featherweight. And so it's just like that's a big different, like that's two different completely weights from heavyweight to featherweight. And he could tell them both of them what they'd weigh the next day when yeah. they let him drink what he what, what he was giving them. And um, so, yeah, no, we, we would like spend a lot of time talking. He had his brothers there. Um, and yeah, he loves, uh, 
he loves all these hypothetical things like putting you in a situation where like what would you do if you only had 10 pounds and you were out in another like <laughs> and how would you play like that's and it's just simple things like that but we, we we have a lot of this common like we have a shared history we have a lot of like obviously things in common and we would speak about a lot of the you know and um yeah because i i guess i could relate to him because he's not lived that normal traveler gypsy life and maybe right. have i where most of our peers and people around us and people within the camp would have, you know. Yeah. Um, and so they're kind of not, not, kind of still in that mindset where me and he, like he knows there's not that he knows, but he can see that there are other options and things like that. So, yeah, look, we we are quite close, and I do, I, I, I care for him more than I do. Like he's not just a fighter to me. None, none of the fight, lads is just fighting. I don't think it ever will be, but like you know. No, but you could see you could see that in I suppose the outpour of emotion after. But even like obviously there was lots from him. But even looking at yourself, just how chuffed you were. Obviously, it was a brilliant performance, and of course he wins so emphatically, and, and everybody was blown away by it. But just I suppose from your point of view, as part of the camp went into it, the satisfaction you took out of that. Yeah, well, like um, it's, just, it's well known now. Like Tyson, what, Tyson had this trainer called Ben Davidson, who to me I think is one of the like best young trainers out there and uh, I watched the thing Andy sorry I watched the program before in the build up to the fight it was himself and David Hay and I don't, I forget who was presenting but it was on Sky Sports yeah. breaking down the fight and he spoke about I think he was saying Wilder always has the hand out here and that's when you know and he was always fainting Tyson Fury and he broke it down unbelievably well um, yeah but he I, I was so impressed with him now Ben Davis he was really good yeah and he, he, he strikes me as a bird like whenever I spoke to him He's very impressive and he seems to have done it like burst onto the scene as a coach and done really, really well. But what, Tyson rang me out of the blue and said, look, I need a new coach. It's not working out with Ben. I didn't get into the reasons why, but I was surprised. And so he, he asked me, who who would I recommend? And we spoke and we talked about 10 to 15 different coaches from all over the world. And none of them would have, it was like we, between the two of us, we knew them all. And the only one, the only one I would really stand stand over was Sugar Hill, and he said, "Andy, funny enough, that's who I was thinking about." So I, I, oh, I'm saying this: the outpouring of emotion came from I felt a lot of responsibility for. Okay. But I like had the fight not gone right because he rang me. I recommended Sugar Hill, and then I was involved coaching, and the thing was, Tyson was we not that we yeah we completely changed his style. Um, you can see the first fight while they compared to this fight, the the two different performances. It's like two different fight fights, you know, like two different completely different fighters in the ring. Yeah, the fact that Tyson was very in the first fight was was uh, using his finesse, flicking and fainting and moving around and trying to be trying to avoid and counter Wilder. And this and the second he fight, he fought this time. Yeah, he just went went out and, and took him out. Yeah, very aggressive and it's the, like that. I know that's what Sugar Hill can do. That's Sugar Hill style and. Sugar Hillcomb was committed to that game plan. So was Tyson. So was I. But <clears throat> anyone I asked, people who I respect their opinions, they would they were saying to me just like without knowing what we were going to do or what we were planning on doing was just um, do what you did last. To tell Tyson to do what he did last time. Don't concede the two knockdowns and he wins the fight. That was what everyone was saying. So we were going completely against that. Mm. And it was very risky because you're going into the biggest puncher in heavyweight history and you're walking into him and not stepping back. And um, yeah, that's that's why I I kind of uh, went a bit excessive with the celebration at the end. No, because but, I but, felt like, I, the night before the fight, I was thinking to myself like, this, if this goes wrong, like it's on me, you know what I mean? It's like, I feel like, I feel like, because of also the bond there with, you know, yeah. this is like, this is not going to be something easy. And Tyson, as I said about the gypsies, gypsies and travelers, Tyson is, he's the man now. You know, he's carrying yeah. the, the torch for all of us and for all young people, young travelers and, and gypsies to, to be something that they can be proud of, to hold up, you know, to society and show, that, show them that they can do something else with their lives too. So, yeah, he is uh, the Gypsy King, as he says himself. It's unbelievable, and it's a hell of a responsibility it took on, but fully justified, Andy, because even myself watching the fight, he was so offensive that night, uh, and so dominant, and on the front foot and coming attacking, which was brilliant to see, but you're dead right. You said I watched every build-up, I watched every kind of, uh, and every pundit, everyone was calling it that. 
let him just outbox him and use his skills rather than actually going toe to toe with him or taking him on. Um, but I can totally see what you're saying. It might have been risky, mm. but I th- have you spoken since Mr. Tyson now kind of fully of the opinion? Look, that was unbelievably great call. Mm, yeah, and the, the thing is, he's not only about. That was only eight weeks of that. That's training. That style, and he only he we really only added a couple of things like his jab. He changed. His, we changed his jab completely. Where his jab before was a an occupational jab. Now his jab is a weapon, and it's an authoritative jab. And something that Wilder was. You can see the first jab he landed. Wilder was taken aback, mm-hmm. and um, there's a lot more that that can be added. You know, there's a lot. Lot. He's only like starting to punch now. With, with real, like actually punch correctly. You think. I'm not sure if you ever seen that in football, or, but like there's, there's 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 plenty of fighters at the top level who still don't know how to correctly throw a jab. You know what I mean? Or like do the basic fundamentals because you get so far on talent, and then you never actually go back and learn the basics, which you should have. If you're not so talented at the start, you will learn. You know. It's funny you say that, right? If you ever watch Raheem Sterling play, <coughs> like, unbelievable yeah. talent. There's talk of now going to Real Madrid or Barcelona, wherever he's already at Man City, he's running them up. He can't strike the ball like a proper ping or like um, if you look at him and, and it's something, whatever as he, like he has all the skills in the world, he's so quick, but he can't actually strike the ball correctly. Uh, now I'm sure he's probably learning now, but, but it's something like, uh, it's, I totally get what you're saying about boxers and that they can't pro- properly hit. Uh, yeah. And is that something you can rectify or you, you have to do with at the early days and forget about it? No, it just takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of drilling and repeti- repetition. You know, it's it's boring and it's hard, but like what you saw in Tyson, like what we just did with Tyson was definitely, it was just drill a jab, step back, jab, step back, jab, step back, one, two. And that was it. And if Ty, if Wilder attacks, you pull back with your, with your hand high. And that was it. And that's, we did that every day, every day. There was nothing, there was no 10 punch combinations, pop, 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 slip, 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 pull all this fat. It was just jab, jab, one, two, step back, one, two. And it was like it was boring, <laughs> but it was it was it was hard. It, that's hard work. All yeah. the flashy stuff are looking good. It's easy, but actually sitting in a position where your cores engage, your legs are engaged, you're, you know, and you're you're actually punching correctly. It's very hard. Okay, Andy, you've been so good with your time. I could talk to you all night. Um, yeah. Just lastly, before I let you go, um, I suppose just where boxing is at the moment, it seems to be in a very healthy position. Um, obviously Sky and I know the, 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 the marketing and all that goes behind it but just the heavyweight division and you're involved in it yourself he, he'll have to fight Joshua will he? Yeah who knows which way it'll fall now with this obviously the, this virus and everything being being out of stop at a standstill Joshua was due to fight Pulev in Tottenham's new stadium and the rematch of why it was supposed to happen in July everything's up in the air but they'll have to fight. They will. They'll have to fight. And uh, I think they both want it. There's so much money to be made there. And um, both guys will be confident of winning. So, yeah, it'll be a great fight. And, yeah, they're, like, boxing uh, across the board is back. Uh, I think it's at its, ha- its peak, really. It's, I don't know if it's ever been as well. Matchroom has done an unbelievable job from all yeah. building it. And now in America, you have top rank ESPN Plus And the zone is, is, is growing and growing. And there's huge opportunities for fighters now. You know, like, you don't have to be, like, it was very hard to get a world title fight. Now now all you have to do is, like, win a certain amount of fights, get yourself into a position and stay ready. And there's so many fights happening. Mm. And also, there are plenty of bel- belts around that you can get a world title fight, you know. So there are opportunities there. And uh, it's a good time for boxing. Okay, well, Andy, it's been an absolute pleasure. As I said, I could talk to you all night, but we will have plenty of conversations in the future. Um, I love the punditry and all the stuff and I wish you well in the coaching career as well and you're so likeable everybody loves you cheers I'm saying to you and we'll see you soon okay I'll see you um, I'll see you in the law society <laughs> I'll be right back you'll be in the and midfield up your game this year we'll, we'll game. get past the semis this year we'll get past exactly. the semis that's the target yeah. you need to yeah. bring us into a camp for a week before we go in yeah I think so I think we should do a bit of training anyway Exactly, yeah. Listen, thanks, yes, for, me, thanks for having me. Thanks very much. Good talk. All the best.